things mm -hmm. about uh, stability is to anticipate some storage conditions that are not under control, uh, not on, under our control. So we have to anticipate the worst case scenario. And then we want to respect the wine profile. So aromatic, organoleptic, but also color and texture. So there is many stabilities we can talk about and we will talk about today. Um, the first one being microbial stability. So this is really about making sure the wine, uh, we respect the wine profile and we don't get contaminated and spoiled during aging or later in the bottle. Uh, oxidative stability, that's something we really build on all the way uh, during the full process of wine making. And we focus here on building resistance to the wine. So the wine can, in case there is uh, some um, oxygen pickup during bottling, the wine doesn't uh, completely uh, change and evolve too fast. Uh, but also one very important step on the oxidative stability, it's going to be the choice of your closure. These two stabilities are really about winemaking process. Uh, while the next ones will be really about anticipate, uh, anticipating storage condition. So protein stability is um, about removing this unstable protein that do create a haze in the wine when we uh, change temperature conditions. So that's highly related to uh, storage conditions. Tartaric stability, we are going to prevent the formation and precipitation of crystals, of tartrate crystals in the wine, in the bottle. And color stability, that's more about red wine. And the idea here is, again, to uh, prevent the precipitation of color in uh, the bottle. So you have the two first um, stabilities that are really something we can work on the full process and um, before bottling. The three last stability are about um, anticipate, anticipating storage conditions. Since it's a lot uh, to cover today, I will really focus on giving you the tools and the solutions to um, reach these stabilities and to prevent precipitation or to prevent spoilage and maintain the wine quality over time. Uh, we will not talk too much in detail about the problem itself, just about the solution. Then there is other webinars that has been done, especially on microbial and oxidative uh, stabilities please feel free to uh, go on our YouTube channel and check them out because I go much deeper in each of uh, these points. Okay, so let's start with the microbial stability. Um, again, here I'm gonna focus only on one uh, solution that is the, um, for me, the most effective and the widest to maintain, uh, to protect wine from spoilage and con microbial contamination but also once you arrive closer to bottling, uh, sterile filtration is a very good option to achieve a microbial stability in the bottle. There is other tools, and I invite you to watch the webinar um, on microbial control that is on our YouTube channel. So today I want to talk about ketosan. Ketosan is a finding agent that has a wide spectrum antimicrobial effect. So ketosan, is actually vegan, allergen-free, biodegradable. Uh, it's coming from, it's a polysaccharide that is coming from Aspergillus niger, and it is gonna uh, bind with the cells, alter their metabolism and kill them. Um, and we are talking about Brettanomyces, Lactobacillus pediococcus onococcus, so lactic acid bacteria, and also acetic acid bacteria. So ketosan is a very powerful tool to control microbes. Lamotabie developed a product, 100% ketosan, that is called Kill Bread, uh, even if it doesn't kill only bread. Uh, it's, um, the, it gives us the ability to work at very low dosage, so reduce the impact we could have on the wine profile. To explain you a little bit how ketosan works, I have some pictures here that you can see. Uh, we have the first picture where my um, mouse is that show uh, Bretanomyces cells, happy, healthy, all good. Next 
to it, there is um, the picture of the same cells, but one day after we add the ketosan, you can see that the cells are actually starting to not be fully um, integrated and start to leak. So the ketosan did bind to uh, the cells and is starting to alter the membrane. Four days after, the cell is not full and is leaking completely. So the cell is dead. Eight days after, uh, you can see here there is not even a cell. So the cell is completely disintegrated. Okay, so that's a very efficient treatment. I like to recommend it as preventive. So prevention means post malo. Don't use it during malo because it removes anococcus. But post malo, if you do malo or post fermentation, otherwise you can use two to four grams per hectoliters and leave it in the wine. You don't need to rack, even if it's a fining agent. The racking is not necessary at this point. Um, your wine is going to be protected for four months. Curative, so curative means treatment. You know you have a contamination. You know the wine is um, or might got spoiled. You go uh, with six to eight grams per hectoliters, followed by a racking a good week to 10 days after to remove these dead cells, and then two grams per hectoliters for protection. OK? So I focused on this product because it is the widest microbial agent, widest spectrum microbial agent we have available in winemaking, but also because we are focusing on sustainable um, tools. And this can be a great alternative to sulfur. Uh, so vegan, allergen-free, biodegradable. Uh, we are completely in the sustainable uh, category. So just I want to show you some results of trials. Um, on different microbes of the efficiency of killbred. So this is uh, about Bretanomyces. We are looking here in blue at the number of cells uh, present in uh, the wine, and in purple, the amount of volatile phenol produced by Bretanomyces, so the amount of bread taint in the wine. If we compare the control that is here with the killbred that is here, uh, you can see that the impact of adding four grams per hectoliters of killbred completely remove uh, the cells and allowed us to reduce the amount of uh, volatile phenol. So killbred treatment worked. If we compare the control batonnage with the killbred batonnage is exactly the same result. We reduce the amount of bread cells and we reduce the amount of volatile phenol. Another information here that is very interesting is the difference between control and control batonnage or killbred and killbred batonnage. This means that uh, when you stir, you are basically uh, reputting cells in suspension and releasing some nutrients for bretanomyces. So a stirring is going to increase the uh, population of bretanomyces alive in the wine, but also increase a lot the volatile phenol. When this is done with killbred, we see we do increase the population of bretanomyces, so we didn't at this, in this wine, four grams per hectoliter was not enough to kill all the cells, but uh, we still killed a good amount because you see there is a big difference here. Uh, but what is important is that it was enough to completely alter the metabolism of all the cells because we don't have any production of volatile phenol. So we have some cells, but they are not active. Okay. Then on lactic acid bacteria, so this is a graph showing you a wine with no sulfur and four grams per hectoliter of killbred during aging versus a wine with just uh, sulfur, which is 30 milligrams per liter of free sulfur here uh, that is in blue. And you can see that over the course of three months from March to June, uh, the lactic acid bacteria went down and the killbred was as efficient as sulfur. Here we are looking at acetic acid bacteria, same trial. So yellow is no sulfur, only killbred, and blue is free uh, sulfur of 30 milligrams per liter um, adjusted during the course of aging. This graph is a little bit different. Um, the population of acetic acid bacteria when were going up because we got some dissolved oxygen. So we used tannescence volume and aroma protect, which are very good antioxidant uh, product, oxygen scavenger, uh, to really reduce ox dissolve oxygen, reduce the um, availability of uh, nutrients for the acetic acid bacteria. And it did work. 
And that's where you can see that with sulfur, it worked for two months, but not enough. Then the population start to build up again, while kill bread has been enough to completely um, eliminate and kill all the acetic acid bacteria. So kill bread is a great tool to control microbes during aging, but it also can be a tool to be used uh, before bottling if you want to be sure you have nothing. Um, you go uh, unfiltered and you go in your, uh, you want to be in your bottle without contamination. Okay, the next stability here is oxidative stability. Here as well, this is really a stability that's involved on entire winemaking process. It's a pretty complex stability uh, to reach. And I invite you to watch the webinar where I focus only on this. Today, I want to focus on only one tool that will could be considered as an alternative to sulfur and uh, is a natural approach of uh, reaching or building oxidation resistance of the wine. Okay, so improving wine shelf life, uh, which is Aroma Protect. So Aroma Protect is actually a yeast derivate rich in sulfur peptides. So um, this is another way to say glutathione. It's a product that we would use uh, at the end of fermentation, but also during aging, uh, it can happen. And at those age of 10 to 30 grams per hectoliters, it will increase the natural antioxidant um, protection resistance uh, of the wine and elongate shelf life. Here you can see the composition, but really where I want to focus your attention is on a uh, trial result. So I'm comparing a control with a wine that we added Aroma Protect, end of fermentation, and we are looking at uh, the evolution here over three months. So the control and the Aroma Protect are these two uh, lines here that are the same wine at the beginning. And then we look at the evolution of aromas of thiolic compounds here, uh, where you can see three months after the control lost its full uh, acetate 3MH, which is a thiol, thiol compound that smells like exotic fruit. And about 76% of the 3MH, which is another thiol that smells more like um, citrusy. So in three months, the control completely lost its uh, aromatic expression and thiolic compounds, while the wine with Aroma Protect maintain uh, a very well nice profile with only a loss of 4% of the 3MH. So it, it's very efficient. Then another trial, which is another wine, six months after, here we are looking at how much uh, thiolic compounds we lost uh, during six months. And you can see that the control here, which is where it's témoin, the control lost about 55 to 75% of this thiol, depending which molecule we are talking about, while uh, the Aroma Protect lost only 20 to 30% in six months. So a pretty impressive result that really allows you to maintain the wine quality, which is what stability is about uh, during aging, but also uh, on the shelf uh, at bottling. Okay. Next stability here, uh, protein stability. So here we are talking about avoiding uh, or preventing the formation of a haze, as you can see in the picture, in the bottle. The most common um, issue of here is an uh, example, I would say, is somebody that buys a bottle of, comes to your tasting room, buys a bottle of your uh, white wine, put it in the car, goes to the next uh, tasting room, and at the end of the day, spend a full day uh, with the wine in the car during hot um, weather, and then the wine is cloudy at the end. This is to be avoided and to, because um, one of the first um, parameters the consumer is going to reject a wine on is its visual aspect and the cloudiness. Protein stability, the haze created by protein, is actually not impacting the taste of the wine. It's only visual aspect. So to um, achieve protein stability, the most known and um, common way is to use bentonite. So I will talk about bentonite. There is not much new um, right now about this, but there is like, some very important information about bentonite that you should know. First is how to choose your bentonite. There is different type of bentonite and within this type, they are all very different. But in categories, you have the sodium bentonite, 
that is having a high water absorption, um, which, yeah, absorb a lot of water, which means when you prepare this bentonite and when you make it swell, you usually see a lot of volume increase, but also you're gonna see a lot of leaks. This bentonite is the most efficient for protein removal. Then you have the calcium um, bentonite, which has a low water absorption, so it doesn't create as much lees, it doesn't swell as much, uh, but it's not as efficient for protein removal, but it's good for compaction. To remember, I use the fact that calcium bentonite is with a C as compaction. And then you have the calcium bentonite sodium activated, which are the one in between, usually good with protein removal with lower uh, lees produced. So make sure that you use a sodium bentonite or calcium bentonite sodium activated to remove your protein. Then uh, when we talk about uh, Lamotabie, uh, options, we have two. And we have the bentosol poudre, which is our sodium bentonite. Uh, we always focus on high quality uh, and purification of our product. So even our basic sodium bentonite is actually highly purified. As you can see, the powder is very white, uh, very soft, very clean, and uh, it's very efficient in removing protein while being very gentle on aromatic profile of the wine. Then we have another bentonite, and that's uh, the new thing that um, exists on the wine market right now. It's a specific bentonite that can be used during cross flow. So it's called Bentosol FT. It is an ultra purified bentonite that will not damage, doesn't have abrasive um, effect. So will not damage the membrane of your uh, cross flow filter. This means you can, uh, and with a filter like our filter um, at Booker, uh, you can do an inline in injection of this specific bentonite. So you can inject in line, which means that in one way, you are filtering and stabilizing your wine for protein. This allows you to save a lot of time, but also a lot of um, cleaning. You don't have to rack to another tank. You don't have to let it settle for 10 days and act for 10 days. Uh, you also save a lot of quality because you don't move the wine as much only one time. And then uh, you say volume because you don't have all these leaves that you have to um, rack off and eliminate. So a very um, interesting way to stabilize um, wine for protein is to use uh, the Bantosol FT when you're filtering with CrossFlow. I'm happy to give you more information on this uh, after the webinar at the end, if you want to. Some tips about efficiency of protein of bentonite in protein removals is that it's um, a better efficiency at lower pH because the bentonite will be more charged, but also because the protein, as you can see in the graph here, will be more charged. So there is a better attraction between um, each other, bentonite and protein, which makes it more efficient. Higher temperature. Um, means better efficiency and also when there is high alcohol, there is a lower efficiency of the bentonite. All these together, can uh, it's a pretty um, easy conclusion to make that for best efficiency, you want to add bentonite during fermentation. So basically, uh, you have a lower pH, you still, you didn't go through malo yet, and you have a higher temperature and lower alcohol. So everything is perfect for a better efficiency, which means you will have uh, less bentonite to use to reach uh, full stability. You're gonna ask me, how do I know? Because I didn't test, I don't know how much bentonite I should use. This is with experience. If you use the same vineyard and work with the same vineyard all the time and you know you always need 50 grams per hectoliters of bentonite to reach stability or more or less in this range, you can go with 20 gram per hectoliters during fermentation in a pretty safe way. And you might have to add five more, but maybe you will be stable without having too much impact on your mouthfeel and aromatic profile. A quick tip about testing. So the testing for protein stability is a heat test. Uh, there is different ways. You can add tannins or not. You can do 60 degrees or 80 degrees. That's up to you. One important thing is to make sure the test is done with the same bentonite you are gonna use. 
because they are all different. So use the bentonite that you will in your test that you will use uh, on your wine. For this, I'm happy to send you samples of the bentonite if you want to do some testing with it. Okay, then there is other ways that we can use to reduce the bentonite needs and to improve protein stability. Usually these steps are not enough to reach protein stability, but it can be enough to reduce halfway your bentonite needs to, to um, improve your wine quality because you don't have to um, find so strong. One way is to stabilize protein with these derivatives. So that's a very, um, we inspired ourselves of uh, the nature, I would say. Um, you probably realize that if you age a wine for a longer time on lease, your wine is more protein stable than a wine that stayed only um, two months in a stainless steel tank without lease. So that's uh, because manoprotein and yeast extract will help um, reaching stability. So using these derivatives such as Nature Soft um, will help you uh, stabilizing some of the protein. The other thing is about removing some unstable protein with tannins. So that's actually taking the opposite approach of in a red wine. So in a red wine, we want to remove um, protein because they react with our tannins and then we lose our own tannins. So we know protein and tannins react together. This time we want to add tannins uh, to catch this protein and remove this unstable protein. Okay, so the tannin we use in white and rosé is called tannin gallic al alcohol. It is a gallic tannin and developed for white and rosé mostly because it's gentle on the mouthfeel, it's very efficient on protein, but also because its color, as you can see here, is um, a light beige. So it's not going to impact the color of the wine as uh, many other tannin could do. We recommend five grams per hectoliters on grapes and juice or during fermentation, but early in the process. Here you can see a graph where there is studies on how much, how tannins can impact the bentonite needs to stabilize for protein. And it's pretty impressive how we can reduce. Uh, you see the control here to achieve protein. We need eight stability. We need 80 grams per hectoliters of bentonite. While with these two tannins, we actually need only 50. So a pretty impressive um, result here. So these are tools that will help you achieving uh, protein stability with reducing uh, bentonite needs. Okay, so the uh, another uh, stability that we need to talk about is tartrate stability. So. You already know uh, that uh, tartaric acid is present in wine, that tartaric acid uh, will combine uh, in, uh, with potassium ions and produce um, some crystals that will precipitate. This uh, crystal formation will depend on temperature, will depend on pH, will depend on the colloidal composition of your wine, will depend on the alcohol content of many parameters. Today, um, once again, I want to focus on the solution. So I will give you different options, different solutions that you can use to um, stabilize your wine uh, for tartrate stability. So to uh, avoid the precipitation of tartaric acid in the bottle, but also maintaining the wine quality. So we're gonna talk about two different families of um, approach. One is a subtractive approach. Uh, which is traditional uh, cold hold, but also could be electrodialysis, uh, ion exchange. Uh, but, and then we will talk about inhibitive uh, methods, which are uh, additive approach, which is the addition of CMC or manoprotein. Okay, so let's uh, start with the subtractive method and we will focus on the cold hold and seeding, which is the uh, most common way uh, to stabilize tartrate. The idea is to put it cold, to seed it, so we increase the concentration of tartrate, and then we precipitate it with maintaining it cold. It's a subtractive method because we are removing some tartaric acid and potassium ion from the wine. There is pros and cons. The pros are that you can treat very high level of instabilities, and when you are talking about a very unstable wine, this is usually the only method. 
then it's a pro, but it could also, also be a cons. You can change pH and TA, and usually the cat is at 3.6 of pH. That's where you are going to increase or decrease your uh, pH with um, cold hold. Then it's going to help stabilizing the calcium tartrate as well, uh, stability. The cons, it has a very high cost in terms of um, energy, labor, water, and process. And here I have some uh, study to show you. So this is a study that has been done in Europe, but it doesn't really matter if we don't look at the number, we just compare uh, the different uh, numbers. Uh, that makes uh, it's very interesting to see that a cold treatment or a cold treatment with seeding is way, way more expensive than a treatment with CMC in this example that um, would be one of the alternatives we're going to talk about. So there is a huge cost involved um, because of energy, labor, but also water process and then buying the cream of tartar. That's another um, study that has been done by the AWRI that look at the energy consumption uh, within a winery within a year. And you can see that 65% of this energy is due to refrigeration, which is mostly uh, related to a cold hold. So if we don't use cold uh, to stabilize portal trade, we can do huge saving in terms of, um, yes, economic saving, but also in terms of energy and be more sustainable. So there is a huge impact, uh, environmental impact of using methods like cold hold. Also, you lose volume because you are uh, actually precipitating uh, tartrates and so you create lees that you have to rack. You can you are changing your PHTA, that can be uh, good and bad. There is high risk of oxidation because you are working very cold, and that's actually one of the biggest risks of oxidation in the winemaking process is you're working very cold and you're racking, pumping your wine very cold where you dissolve a lot of oxygen, and then usually the step after this is filtration bottling you warm up your tank and that's where you consume all the oxygen that has been dissolved. So big change in terms of quality of the wine because of the risk of oxidation, because of the change of PHTA, and it is not adaptable for small volume. Okay, so it is a traditional method. Yes, it's very efficient, but there is a lot of cons against it, especially um, regarding the cost and the environmental impact and the quality of the wine. If we look at crystallization inhibitors, so additive methods, uh, here I want to focus on CMCs or carboxymethyl cellulose. There is same pros and cons. Uh, the pros is that the cost is very low. Um, cost of addition is very low. It's very quick and easy addition. It, you have your tank, you basically have to take your product, add it in, mix it and you're fine. So you don't have to cool it down. You don't have to pump the wine somewhere else. You don't have to do any racking or any cleaning of the tank because you are racking out. So it's energy and water saving. There is no impact on the wine profile. So no impact on PHTA, but also on the mouthfeel. So you maintain and preserve the wine quality, which is what we are doing when we are talking about stability. The cons, uh, it can interact with protein. So we have to be careful in whites and rosé to really stabilize our wine very good before we can add um, CMC. And I want to show you an example of what can happen if your wine is not protein stable and you add CMC, you can actually uh, produce all these little uh, flocculates, white flocculates and haziness. So it is a very important part. Then it's not adaptable for red wine because it can interact with color and pre create color precipitation. So there is wine requirements to use CMC, which is only on whites and light rosé, only on wine that are protein stable, only we, on wine that are filtrable with a low turbidity. Okay, then not every CMC is the same. Uh, they are actually all very different by their concentration, their efficiency, which we are talking about saturation degree and polymerization degree and their filtrability, same thing, we talk about the polymerization degree and the hydrolysis. All these points are connected and they make each CMC different. 
Oui, at La Motabier propose a solution of five persons, a CMC of five persons that has a high efficiency and a low viscosity. So we really worked on making sure the product is fully filtrable. So you can add it before filtration if you want to and uh, with a high efficiency. So even if it's a 5% solution, we use only 100 to 200 mils per hectoliters, depending the test, uh, your test result. On steel wine, we use it 24 to 72 hours before final filtration or bottling. On sparkling wine, we use it at tirage. Okay. Another approach uh, in terms of crystallization inhibitors, because I just gave you a solution with some requirements. I need to give you a solution for other type of wine, uh, which is a yeast manoprotein. So same thing then uh, for the protein stability. This has been inspired by just observing that when the wine stay longer on lees, uh, usually we are more stable. In terms of protein, yes, but also in terms of tartrate. So we start to look into this manoprotein and understand what part of the manoprotein helps stability and we found only one specific piece of the manoprotein that I will talk about. But basically the post on using yeast manoprotein is that you're going to stabilize color and tartrate. You can improve the mouthfeel because it does give you a little bit of roundness into the, um, in, in the wine. It is a very natural approach because they are a yeast manoprotein extracted from actually yeast in the wine. Easy and quick addition. It's a liquid product that you add just before your final filtration. You maintain and preserve the wine quality. There is no interaction with protein or color except stabilization of color. And you can use it in red, rosé, white, and sparkling. So it's very versatile and very uh, universal for every type of wine. The cons, because there is always a cons, is the cost. Uh, the manoprotein cost uh, is much more expensive than CMC. It is still um, a better option than cold rolled and seeding. So we are still uh, in a lower cost than using energy and uh, seeding. So the wine requirements, only one that the wine should be filtrable and that's only because we are uh, then filtering the wine. But if you don't filter before bottling, you don't even need to be filtrable. So the product we propose is called Stab K. Uh, it is a very effective and convenient product. So not every manoprotein will work for a stabilization of a tartaric, tartaric stabilization. So we uh, found that there is one part of the manoprotein called MP40 present in, um, in the yeast that will work. So we isolate this um, manoprotein from the yeast with enzymes. So this uh, explains you that it's a very natural process and approach. It is uh, made then into a liquid product, so convenient and easy to use. It's effective on color and tartrate stabilization, pH independent. So no matter the wine we are talking about, you can use it. And there is no impact on filtrability. You can see here uh, the um, a result where I show you some pictures, I think it speaks more than numbers, but basically we look at the uh, crystallization test and then the presence of crystals or not. You can see the control has a lot of crystals while uh, the stab K has none. And the filtrability index didn't change, actually got better, but at this level it didn't change. The application, 50 to 150 mils per hectoliter, same than CMC on steel wine, 24 to 72 hours before filtration, on sparkling uh, at tirage. Okay, so here I have some, um, I kind of always have the same questions about tartaric stabilization. So I thought I would start asking them and answering them right away. And of course, I'm sure you will have many questions and I will have the um, question and answer portion after. But here, um, some very generic questions. So which analysis to evaluate the vinoprotect or STAB-K effect? We usually recommend to use a crystallization test or conductivity test. What's the impact on filtrability? If the wine is filtrable to start with, um, there is uh, no impact on the filtrability of using vinoprotect or STAB-K. When to add it? 
24 to 48, in fact, 24 to 72 hours pre-bottling and final filtration uh, for still wine and uh, at tirage for sparkling. What's the sensory impact? Vinoprotect has no sensory impact, while Stab K will increase the volume and the roundness of the wine. Are Vinoprotect and Stab K reacting with protein? Vinoprotect uh, should be only used in um, protein-stable wine because Vinoprotect can react with protein as any CMC product. Stab K has no interaction with protein, so there is no problem to use it if you are just borderline. What's the reaction with phenolic compounds and color? Vinoprotect cannot be used on reds or dark, dark rosé because it will react with color. Stab K will improve the color stability in reds. Okay, so last stability uh, point, and then I will um, conclude and take all your question, is about color stabilization. Color stability, we are talking about red wine here, and we are talking about this precipitate that you can find in the bottle. That's, um, again, it's more about, uh, there is no impact on the taste, it's more about a consumer uh, approach that we, uh, there is studies that show that a lot of consumer will reject a wine if they see a deposit uh, in the bottle, okay? Color stability is highly related to tartaric stability. In fact, when one, ha when one happened, the other one happened too. Uh, they are completely linked as they are linked to the colloidal composition of the wine. Uh, if we start to precipitate color, usually crystals, tartaric crystals start to um, be produced as well. So we are talking about working during the entire winemaking process and same here, I have a webinar focused on color management and color stability. I highly recommend you to watch it. Uh, but there I'm talking about the use of tannins and manoprotein uh, during fermentation, during aging to really help stabilizing uh, this uh, color. I have one graph here that I can show you, but again, I explain it much better in my other webinars. That's trials where we put um, we have a control and then we put different products in, um, in the wine during fermentation and we look at the color uh, intensity three months post mallow. And as you can see, uh, basically each product has a different effect, but all of them has been efficient in maintaining more color um, post mallow lactic. Okay, then once you arrive closer to bottling, that's where um, we are talking about you removing unstable color. So this can happen with the cold rolled when you do your cold roll for tartrate, some color uh, drop as well. It can happen naturally with time or with uh, lease aging. We uh, developed a finding agent that uh, I'm focusing again on a vegan allergen free uh, finding agent, which is called Naturefin Prestige based on yeast derivate. As you can see here, we uh, are comparing a control, Naturefin Prestige and uh, albumin, so egg white. Um, and we are looking at the turbidity after a cold hold uh, of the wine. So this is a way to test our uh, stability of color. We do a cold hold, we look at the turbidity change. If the wine is very turbid, it means the um, color is not stable. And this shows that basically with the finding, both finding helped reaching uh, color stability. Naturefin Prestige worked a little bit better than albumin, but this basically the conclusion is this is a great alternative to uh, egg white to stabilize color and to remove any unstable color that will precipitate later. And then when we're talking about really last minute pre-bottling stabilizer, um, we have the options of Arabic gum and manoprotein. I put stabilizer in a um, in, in quotes, uh, because um, Arabic gum is actually not considered as a full stabilizer, but Arabic gum is uh, maintaining a stability or elongating a stability already achieved, while stab K, or yeast manoprotein, will uh, reach achieve stability, okay? And I already talked about stab K before, I just want to show you results on red wine, since I show you only on white wine before. 
Uh, and here you can see, so there is two different wines. One is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot based. The other one is Carignan Grenache based. We are looking at the crystal presence, the cold hold, which means uh, how much uh, stable is the color. Usually below 20, we consider it stable. And then we look at the filtrability index, just to show you that we are not um, making the wine unfiltered unfiltrable, but we are actually improving the filtrability as well. So in this situation, the control is um, not tartaric stable, not color stable, and okay with filtra filtrability. And as you can see, when we filter it on a pad after the cold hold, there is a lot of color and crystals. Stab K at 50 mils, we are still not stable. Tartaric color either. So we didn't even do the filtrability index. Stab K at 150 mils per hectoliter. We are now stable in terms of tartaric. We are stable in terms of color, and we are even more filtrable. As you can see, the pad. This is a very light uh, color with no crystals. We look at the next uh, trial, and it's pretty much the same result, except that uh, we are already stable at 50 mils per hectoliter. This wine was already tartaric stable, and was having a color almost stable, but not yet. OK, so Stab K is a great tool to reach tartaric and color stability. Uh, it's also a tool that is uh, lasting in a long time. So you can stabilize your wine for many years. Uh, this stability is going to be long lasting. So to conclude, um, of course, uh, stabilization is uh, touching the entire winemaking process, and this is uh, a very big presentation with a lot of information. So I tried to show you only the last minute solution or the solution that comes to uh, the last part of the wine process. Just want to give you some timeline um, as it is very important to uh, think timeline when we talk stabilization, but also think timeline reverse. So you plan your bottling day and from this bottling day, you are gonna start to think uh, when should I add my product? When should I do my test? And um, so on. So for white and rosé, basically the first thing to do is you blend. You will always stabilize wines once final blend is done, uh, oxidative stability is achieved and microbial stability is achieved. Two stable wine blended together doesn't make necessarily a stable wine, okay? So you want to check everything on the final blend. So once these three uh, points are checked, you're gonna do your protein stability test. If you are stable, great, then you can go on testing Vinoprotect and Stab K. Here I'm taking the longest test you can do, which is a crystallization test, six day at minus four Celsius. So it gives you a result at day seven. And at day seven, you will know how much Stab K or Vinoprotect to add. You can then add it and two days after bot bottle, filter and bottle. If you are not protein stable, you're gonna have to uh, add bantosol poudre or bantosol FT and test again your protein stability before you can go in this process. So basically you need a week to uh, test and achieve protein, um, protein and tartrate stability before you can consider bottling. On red wine, uh, we usually don't talk so much about oxidative stability. Uh, so we are having the blending process, the microbial stability. Then we do the color stability test, uh, which is a cold hold, um, 48 hours at four degrees. If it's not stable at this point, nature fin a finding with nature fin prestige will be your option. If it is stable, that's where uh, you can look at stab K, stab K, six day at minus four crystallization test. Um, you don't need to be highly uh, color stable. You see, I put uh, NTU below 20 because stab K can stabilize color too. Day eight, we are at the validation of the stab K dose and you can add it two days after um, filter and bottom. Okay, so you need nine days more or less and the other one you need seven days. So to conclude, uh, in what are the sustainable and efficient tools for wine stabilization, depending uh, each uh, wine stability? Today we talked about Kilbret, 
uh, for the microbial stability. And you will see that uh, in many webinars, I talk about Excellence B Nature, which is a yeast to be added uh, up front for bioprotection. Then uh, in terms of oxidative stability, there is many products we can talk about, such as some fining agents, some tannins, but today we focused on Aroma Protect, which is a source of glutathione that help building the resistance of the wine. Protein stability, of course, you can use bantonite, bantosol poudre, sodium bantonite, but also bantosol FT, which is a bantonite developed to be injected in cross flow filtration. And then other tools such as tannin gallic alcohol and nature soft can be very useful to reduce the amount of bantonite used. Tartaric stability, we have Vinoprotect or Stab K. And then color stability, we have to work on the full process with tannins and manoprotein, but then when we arrive closer to bottling, Stab K will be your solution. Mm -hmm.